this section of our congregation. <laughs> it feels a little empty up here. Uh, last week I sang this song for you. Um, uh, it, it's written kind of like a call and response, but I want to invite everyone to sing both the call and response, if you feel comfortable. Um, please stand. And you can... Like I said, you can just sing the response part if that's what, uh, it's the easy part, it's two words. Um, but as we get going, I'm hoping that you can learn the, the chorus and the, and the verses too. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? Stop the light from getting through We do Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Judah, who conquered the grave, he is the 
together this morning.
for being with us this past week and loving us and providing for us. This past month, you bless these gifts we're about to give. May we use them for you. We thank you in Jesus' name. resurrection really that's a fine belief for you know commoners or the uneducated but not for me that's that's a little too much so they reject God's knowledge and its truth and instead choose to trust their own knowledge or they turn to something else but here's the thing God's knowledge God's truth hasn't changed in thousands of years it hasn't changed Science changes continually. What we think we know, what the world thinks they know, changes continually. Which one trumps the other? I would say the one that doesn't need to be updated. Like a compass, like a compass that points to true north, you can trust it. We all need something in our lives with true north. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man but in the end, it leads to death. Scientists used to mock the words of the Bible where it says that um, Abraham's descendants would be as numerous as the sands of the, of the seashore or the stars of the sky. Skeptics of the, skeptics of the Bible used to laugh at that and say, well, you know, those things don't make sense because we've counted the stars in the sky and there's only 10 or 11,000. But then in 1990, you get this telescope called Hubble and it reveals that there are billions and billions of galaxies with millions of stars in each one. So when you begin to look at that, and you read this article by Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is, who is a, a big critic of Christianity and the idea of belief. He works at the Hayden Planetarium. He's the guy that's responsible for making Pluto not a planet anymore, or making it a minor planet. I always liked Pluto. But he was quoted even in a newspaper um, that the grains of the sand of the earth are similar to the number of stars in the heavens. Who'd have thought? Why is it the Bible, which never changes, always comes up correct? 
Why is it the science textbooks, which teach evolution, have to be changed every few years because their knowledge and their theories continue to be disproven or improved upon or changed or whatever, word, whatever adjective you want to use to describe it? Why is it that the kosher diet unspoken of, or spoken of in the Bible continues to be one of the healthiest diets you can follow, even thousands of years later? Is new knowledge really the answer? We tend to trust in our knowledge, and so we get puffed up our, over our environmental concerns and our medical advancements and our technological knowledge. But do you ever pause to wonder about the knowledge that it took to make the Grand Canyon? Or the human eye? Even Darwin said, the human eye bothers me because I can't explain it. I can't explain how it evolved. Or to create a cicada. A cicada whose tribe shows up every few years. They make a whole lot of noise. They do nothing productive. They party with their friends in the woods and then they die. Who thinks that stuff up? A scientist wouldn't. But science and our knowledge continue to change over the course of time. Are we to believe that suddenly, after all these years of human history, the scientists have finally, finally gotten it right? I mean, I heard the other day that the, the, the world's going to end in 12 years. Scientists may have finally discovered all the truths and will never change their minds from this point forward. Your, your trust, your ultimate trust, has to be in something more infallible than scientists. So while we're thrilled with, our, with continued learning and knowledge, we, we have to keep our eye on the big picture. Well, let me back up a minute. I have this kid who were in the car the other day, and he says, Dad, what do you think of quantum mechanics? I, I don't know. I, I don't think much of it because I don't understand it. He does, but I don't. And it's a big conversation about, OK, does it disprove anything that we need to worry about? Is there anything in quantum mechanics that calls into question what we do here? No. We have to keep our eye on the big picture. I'm only arguing that our human knowledge is not a reliable source of truth. For centuries, people thought the Earth was flat. To them, that was their truth. But then Christopher Columbus brought some, some new evidence and information which changed what they, had, what they thought to be the truth. But if they had read the book of Isaiah, which was written 2,100 years before Columbus, Isaiah talks about the earth, the sphere of the earth, or the ball of the earth, being, the earth being round. Isaiah, 740 B.C., you didn't need Columbus. All you had to do was read the Bible. There is one who is completely reliable, who really knows what is true, who understands the universe, who knows all about every molecule and atom, who knows the way the body and mind are designed and, who will, and what will happen in the future. If our Creator has revealed truth to us, and we believe He has, then that revelation should be our final source of truth. Everything else that we know and we learn runs through that filter. If you want to read a couple really good books, I don't usually do this, but there's a couple out there. Josh McDowell wrote two. He's got one that's called More Than a Carpenter. And the other one is Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And all these are really neat books. They've been out for quite a while. Looking at your text, Romans 1, verse 17, for in the gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Here's your second statement. The world's knowledge is limited, tested. The more we learn, the more we realize that we don't really know very much. In this passage, Paul asserts that people who reject God who do so because of a lifestyle that they want to maintain. It's not because of their desire to be intellectually honest. We hear it all the time. I just can't buy into the whole God thing with the Bible. 
the problem is, it's not that they can't buy into it. They don't allow themselves to buy into it. They aren't willing to because if they did, integrity would demand that they change their own behavior. They hate the Bible because it tells them exactly who they are and what they are. Solomon himself said that he sought after knowledge, and in the end he learned that it was like chasing after the wind. And I know some people will say, well, how can you say knowledge isn't, the, isn't like the end-all, the end-all, be-all? It can't be because it's constantly changing. There's only one source of ultimate truth. Your knowledge base in the last 10 minutes has changed. You're not the same person that walked in here. Some of you walked in here at 9.30. Some of you walked in here at 10.45. You're not the same person you were when you walked in here. Paul talks about this a little bit in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 and 2. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Knowledge, knowledge can do a lot. Knowledge can take a, moon, a man to the moon. It can bring you data from around the world, from the far side of the universe in seconds. Knowledge can help dissolve a cancerous tumor, or replace a heart valve. Knowledge can make you a lot of money if you go on Jeopardy. But there's a lot that knowledge can't do. Let me give you four things knowledge doesn't do. Knowledge doesn't necessarily lead toward truth. Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. It's true that sometimes smart people use their knowledge to hide the truth rather than to expose the truth. We take parts of knowledge or partial knowledge and use it to get what we want. They're smart enough to manipulate what they, what they, what they know to agree with what they want. We can all name politicians. We'll just put every politician's name on the board, okay? And CEOs who have done this, along with plenty of others. You and I probably do it. I do it to my kids constantly. We've all known people at work or college or who are geniuses, and they use their skills to deceive. Instead of being productive with their knowledge, they would use it to cheat to cheat on tests, to cheat on their spouse, to cheat on their taxes, for dishonest gain. You see, oftentimes smart people use their knowledge to avoid the reality of God. Look at Romans 1, 19 and 20. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. If you go out and you look at creation, blue skies, green grass, today, tomorrow there will probably be snow on the green grass. It's Iowa. God made it that way. If you look at all that and you can't realize that there's somebody moving things around, making things happen, you're just ignoring the facts of God. A smart person can always find reasons to believe what they want to believe. They don't want an authority over them so they can make up, they can come up with some kind of, some reasons that everything evolved or there's no life after death while avoiding or ignoring facts that point to just the opposite. You have to weigh the evidence, you evaluate the sources, and you may even allow some time to pass to arrive at a decision. Because... Evidence just keeps coming in. Second, you can't, this is the second thing that true or knowledge can't do. The world's knowledge doesn't always lead to wisdom. Some of the smartest people often do really stupid things. We live in the most educated world, 
and we still can't overcome crime, sexually transmitted disease, abortion, addictions to smoking, addictions to McDonald's. Several years ago, if you remember, if you're old enough, you probably remember the Unabomber. Terrorized the country for, I don't know, 17, 18 years. Ted Kaczynski was a Harvard grad who went on to get his PhD in mathematics at the University of Michigan, and then he sent little bombs to people from a shack in Montana. So much knowledge. Knowledge can be a good thing or it can be a foolish thing. Paul gave some examples of the, for the people that lived during that day in Romans 1, 21, 23. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images, made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. Brilliant people often give their lives to things that are foolish. There are Vikings fans out there. Think about that. Ah. My ice is pretty good. Sometimes out of ignorance and sometimes out of arrogance. We, I'm, I'm done talking about Vikings people, okay? I'm not talking about the Vikings fans anymore, okay? I'm talking about the brilliant people because those aren't the Vikings fans. The point is don't put your total trust in, in man's knowledge. The third thing knowledge can't do or knowledge, yeah, knowledge can't suppress wickedness within mankind. Romans 1, 24 and 25, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. Further down in verse 28, Paul writes, Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. When Paul wrote those words to the people in Rome, everyone acknowledged that this, this was the smartest culture of the time. The setting in Romans chapter 1 is one of, of conquest. The Romans had conquered the known world. They were advanced in technology, military might, roads. Their roads are still out there today that they use. Aqueducts, and they surpassed nearly everyone. Yet the most depraved society in all the world at that time was Rome. Murder, corruption, sexual depravity, the list goes on and on and on. Does this sound familiar if you turn on the TV today? See, knowledge is a false god that puffs you up. There's no substance to it. It's just hot air. G.K. Chesterton wrote, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. And the fourth reason you can't ultimately trust in knowledge is that knowledge can't save us for eternity. Think about it. Knowledge, knowledge can't forgive you. It can't rid us of our guilt. But those are the things that the gospel does. Knowledge is just facts. Faith is about a person and a relationship with God, with a God who is worthy of our trust. So we don't live by knowledge, but we live by faith. This doesn't mean that Christians are, are anti-knowledge. You know, we're, always, we're always called the people who are against science. We're against science. Ask somebody who tells you that how many genders there are. Our faith is built on knowledge. It just means we don't ultimately trust our own knowledge. We trust God's knowledge. So first, God's word is true and powerful, and we need to believe it. Second, the world's knowledge is limited, so test it. And third, this is the final one. God's grace is necessary. Receive it. You see, the message of Romans chapters 1 and 2 shows us that there are all sorts of different sins that we can get involved in. 
The Romans 1 passage talks about the rebellious sinner, the person who is depraved and goes into a totally, in a totally different direction from God. You see that person as a rebellious sinner. But Romans 1 and 2 also talks about the respectable sinner, the one that thinks they're self-righteous, that they're, a, they're above everybody else and they've got it all figured out. I mean, they kind of look down on everybody else. And whether you're a respectable sinner, or a righteous sinner, or a rebellious sinner, here's the deal. Regardless of the camp you find yourself in, we are all of us, every one of us in need of Jesus Christ. So don't get in the habit of looking down at other people saying, well, I can't believe that they do what they do. Because if you have that condescending tone, you've just lumped yourself right in there with the self-righteous category. Christ hates self-righteous people. He wrote a, there's a whole chapter in Matthew devoted just to the self-righteous. He talks about whitewashed tombs and dead men's bones, and it's all about the self-righteous. Romans 2, verse 1, basically says, you are no better. You are no better than they are. Because we all fall in one of these, one of these camps. And then Romans 3 reminds us that that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous, not one. But then you keep going, and after you feel bad about yourself, Paul gets you far enough into Romans that you start feeling bad about yourself. He gives you the antidote in chapter 6. He says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God's grace is, is available to everyone. It's up to us to receive that, to take hold of it and believe it, and, and found our lives on that. We might not have gone too far down the road, but our hearts still get hardened. We've, you and I have, okay, me. I've done stupid things. I picked up enough people already. We put our, I put myself on the throne instead of God often enough. That's why God's grace is necessary. It's up to us to receive that. We love to play the comparison game. I'm glad I'm not like that person, and we always compare ourselves to people that we're out in front of. We never compare ourselves to the people, you know, above or that we know are better, better situated in life. The Bible says that knowledge can make us feel superior. The wording it uses is puffed up. But hopefully in a person's life, there comes that moment when they realize that you don't really know that much. And that there is a God who knows everything. So we eventually swallow our pride. And some of us swallow it early. And some of us, it takes us a little longer to choke it down. But understand, God deserves my trust and your trust, not knowledge. We live and die by the comparison game, but everything, everything is relative. By the world standards, you might think you have incredible knowledge, and you're going so fast as you ride your own knowledge as, as far as you can in this life, and that's fine. As long as you understand it's not taking you to the next life. The Bible says that God is holy, and that in comparison, our holiness is like filthy rags. Our, our knowledge is incomplete. You remember the time last, last week, last month, when you were reading Job? Because everybody's reading a book a week, right? Or a book a day still, right? Job has this discussion with his friends where they tell him why, he's, why all this bad stuff is happening to him. Because he's not holy enough. He's, he must have done something wrong. He's, you know, all these different things. And he's trying to make sense of it, and they're telling him exactly what he needs to hear, what, he, what they think he needs to hear. And then Job starts questioning God. God, why are you doing this to me? Why is this happening? This doesn't make any sense. No good can come of this. And finally, in Job 38, 4 and 5, God shows up and he starts talking to Job. And instead of answering his question, he just looks at him and says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely, surely you know, Job, who stretched a measuring line across it. And God goes on and on 
in a handful of lines that he establishes that when it comes to knowledge, Job, Job doesn't have a clue. The Bible says that our ways are not his ways and that his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We think we should, sometimes we should be up running with the advance group. But the truth is, even the leader of the pack up there isn't in the same hemisphere as, as God. When Queen Victoria was the Queen of England, still, she had a real interest in yacht racing. This is the, this is the middle, late 1800s. And on this particular day, there was going to be this giant, this cup race that was held in the English Channel. And the American yacht was favored to win, but the English yacht was considered a contender. So, so avid was her love for the sport that her servants constructed for her a small lean-to on the cliffs so she could be able to watch the yachts as they, cro as they crossed the line. And she even stationed a man further down with binoculars out on the cliffs of Dover. And it was his responsibility to, to announce when the first sail came into sight. And she was everybody was hopeful that it would be this English yacht. And so they sat and they waited and they waited. And after some time, the man said, Your Majesty, there's, there's a sail. And the queen said, is it the American yacht or the English yacht? And dejectedly, the man said, it's the American yacht. And she replied, quick, look and tell me if the English yacht is in second place. The man looked, and he waited, and he waited, and for a long time they waited. And finally he said, there is no second sail. The American yacht was so far out in front, you couldn't even see second place. And that's how it is with Jesus Christ. You can't take, you can take all your great leaders, all your educators, all your teachers, all your Nobel Prize winners, and you can stack them up and together, they don't even come in second. Jesus Christ is so far out in front that you can't even see the second sale. So we find ourselves back to where we started. Trust in God because ultimately he's the only reliable source of truth. The one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, said that for a reason. He was and is all truth. He knows everything, and that's why he can make such a claim. And even consider placing our ultimate trust in our own knowledge or the world's knowledge to place ourselves higher than the God of all knowledge. The God of the universe would be a tragic mistake that would have eternal consequences. Please understand, Christianity isn't, isn't for the uninformed or the foolish. And a master's degree isn't necessary. What's required is a, is a head that believes in a heart that is open to receiving. When you become a Christian, you don't have to check your brain at the door, just your ego. Christianity and the Bible can reach both your heart and your head. Norman Geisler said, God is not asking you to take a blind leap of faith into the darkness. He's asking you to take a step of faith into the light. And for some of us, for many of us, we're 18 inches away from God. 18 inches away from heaven. 18 inches away from real saving faith. 18 inches of distance from your head to your heart. Before Jesus would heal somebody, this is just closing up. Before Jesus would heal somebody, sometimes he would simply ask, uh, make a request of them. He'd say, just believe. Or in some cases, he would ask, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to stop chasing after the world's knowledge? Sometimes to be healed or to believe, we have to walk away from what the world values and surrender ourselves to the one who laid the foundation of the earth, the one who was there in the beginning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly and gracious Father, we are grateful every day for your love and grace in our lives.
it is easy for us to get wrapped up in the world and science and, and just everything else that goes on. But you teach us, Lord, that if we remain faithful to you, if we trust in you, trust in your knowledge, your grace, your goodness, your righteousness, and your good news, Paul says, who could possibly be against us? Who could prevail against that? So Lord, help us to to embrace that knowledge, your truth, to embrace you and our, our feeble understanding of you. Help us to live like the people you've called us to be. Help us to accomplish your mission as you set out for us so long ago. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, Jesus.